Still here. Arizona Game and Fish Department wildlife biologists Clay Nelson and Darren Bolin are pleased to see that this cattle watering hole, or tank, still has water because that means it may also hold what they are looking for, the endangered tiger salamander. Seems like it would actually be an ideal tank for salamanders. They like a muddy substrate. They also need a lot of uh, branches, twigs, old logs, everything that gets hung up on our seine. That's usually what they need to lay their eggs on. To collect the salamanders, they drag a net called a bag seine across the tank. Yeah, we've got one right here. That's fantastic then. It seemed like an ideal place. This is an abran a branchiated adult. You can see the, the gills on the side of its head here. It's pretty much built for the water still. It's got a long fin. And this is a female. This is about as large as a branchiated adult will get. The salamander is measured and checked for any signs of disease. Total length is 270. Snout vent is 142. It looks like it's been bit on the tail a few times. Then released unharmed back into its murky home. Well, that's good news. Yeah, very much so. Particularly because we didn't find any salamanders here just about a month ago, and we actually dragged this seine across the tank three times. That's good news indeed, especially when you consider that over the course of the year, Arizona Game and Fish Department biologists will check out nearly 200 tanks spread out over 155 square miles in the San Rafael Valley in southern Arizona. This picturesque valley is the only known habitat for this species of salamander. We're all set. The equipment they use covers the spectrum from the very low-tech... Uh, there's not enough water to necessitate bringing the seine down, so we're just bringing a, a dip net down, and we'll pull about 25 samples with the dip net and be done with it after that. To the very high tech. We're looking at a, a topo map that's downloaded into our laptop computer. Uh, and then we work with our GIS analyst and we get GPS points for each of the tanks we're gonna be headed to today. And we download those into our laptop and we can basically see where we are in relation to our tank and the roads on our laptop. It's wide open and you'd think you'd be able to to go anywhere with no problems, but uh, I've been out here <laughs> lost a, f a few times, so this has definitely paid off and improved our efficiency. Looks like we should be taking a left right here then. The tiger salamander is on the federal endangered species list, so the biologists must check a random selection of tanks four times a year to see how they're faring. Very often, they discover that conditions have changed a great deal. Right. That was about a month ago. We came and, and seen this tank for salamanders, and there was over a meter of water here. So in just that short amount of time, you can see it's all dried up. But just because the tank is dry, it doesn't mean it's the end of the salamander. They have a big bag of tricks when it comes to adapting to a changing environment. When the tank dries up like this, it'll initiate them to metamorphose out into a terrestrial form and they'll leave the tank until this tank fills back up with water. At that time, hopefully they'll return and, and reproduce. Another strategy they have is to actually burrow down uh, into the bottom of this tank, into the wet mud, uh, up to a meter deep. Yeah, it's a pretty deep, uh, dynamic ecosystem out here. You know, the tank will have water, it'll dry up, they'll leave, uh, they'll come back, and this can happen over a series of eight years, up to eight years for a salamander. Hey, get out of there, those aren't donuts. Besides the species they are looking for, Clay and Darren come across a number of non-aquatic creatures as well. Yeah, we've got some pretty friendly horses here. I think we're the feed truck. See you later. See you later. Tracking the trail of the tiger salamander is a lot of work for biologists like Clay and Darren. So you may be asking yourself, what makes this small creature worth all this effort? It's a good question. A lot of people uh, ponder that. Uh, the first thing I would say is it's a uh, unique part of the ecosystem down here. It serves a functional role, uh, acting as both prey for some species, wading birds and things like that, and also a predator for a lot of species. Uh, in addition to that, probably the, the greatest concern is that it's 
completely unique within the, this ecosystem in Arizona. There's no other species in the world that has the same genetic uh, makeup as this species does. There's nothing else like it in the world, and uh, who knows uh, what could be held in that, in that DNA. I mean, uh, medical cures, any, anything like that. So it's really important to preserve that diversity. The biologists will spend several days on each survey. It's a very dirty and physically demanding job, but their life is being made much easier thanks to the Arizona State Park Service. You see, the Park Service owns the former San Rafael Ranch, and they let the biologists stay there at no cost. Yeah, it's a really nice relationship we've got. Uh, sure beats working out here in the tanks all day and then trying to set up camp, so uh, they provide us with pretty nice amenities. It's a... Uh... Nice place in the middle of nowhere to have some hot water <laughs> and a roof over your head. The 3,500-acre ranch, including the 100-year-old main house, was purchased by the state through the Arizona Lottery's Heritage Fund. The Heritage Fund also provides money for the salamander survey. So every time you buy a lottery ticket, you are contributing to important projects like these in Arizona. I think it's one of the best deals that ever Arizona State Parks ever made. It really is. To be able to preserve the open spaces like this and be able to not see a telephone pole wherever you look. And this is the, the largest parcel of, remaining parcel of shortgrass prairie left in the United States without subdivisions on it. So. Yeah, this is a special place. Now, the ranch isn't open to the public just yet, but one day it will be, and it'll be a new state park. On the second day in the field, our biologists are joined by Kathy Blosh from the Tucson office. I'm out here helping the biologists in the research branch with this project because I work in the, in the region where these animals actually reside. So we try to, the department tries to involve local biologists within the department that live and work in the areas where that are affected. It's up to you guys. I think from here over there and then back again. But of course not every pool renders the species they're looking for. That's why it was so heavy. Pulling the whole bottom of the tank. Years ago the tiger salamander used to live in the creeks and arroyos that were natural to this valley letting the monsoons dictate their movements. But as those resources became scarce, they found a new home in the watering holes that ranchers built for their livestock. A necessity for the rancher has turned into salvation for the tiger salamander. All right, one down, five to go. <laughs> good job, you guys. I think that's as bad as good as we could have done for this tank. What we do to keep uh, chytrid fungus and other diseases from going from one tank to another is we clean our gear with what is called a quat solution. Um, basically it kills off every disease and virus. What we do with that is we go ahead and put it onto the nets and we go ahead and we disinfect basically anything that comes in contact with, um, with the pond itself. And that way we can keep from transmitting it from this pond to the next one that we're in. There's our tank. There's some cows there, so I bet there's some water too. It is rewarding, most definitely. It's nice to, to come out into an area of Arizona I probably wouldn't have ever have gone to before uh, and to work on a species and, and know I'm helping out. Future generations might, might be able to appreciate the same things I do. This pond we had, uh, actually it's kind of neat because about a month ago um, we went ahead and sang this pond and we uh, sang 200 uh, juveniles out of here. And then today we went ahead and sang it again and we have basically those same juveniles that are starting to, to grow up and get into the adult form. So it's kind of neat to see that they're, they're still here. This tank gives the biologists their largest catch of the day with plenty of both juvenile and adult salamanders to catalog. Snout vent. 74, total length, 150. This is a branchiate uh, salamander. This is the adult morph of the aquatic stage. And it's got three gills on each side of its head, which is, allows it to breathe underwater. Uh, it's got a fin-like structure on the back of its tail, which gives it a, a lot more mobility in the water. They've got some character, don't they? Yeah. 
Our group packs up from this tank and heads out to the next. Since this is the only place on Earth where this species of tiger salamanders are known to exist, watching over them is a team effort. So we're operating with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, also the Forest Service, the state parks, private landowners down here, and uh, Arizona State University. So we're all working together to protect the species. It's a one-shot deal. I mean, that's it once it's gone. So um, we have to have a little bit of foresight when we, when we go to protect a species like that and always keep that in mind.